faith would come up several levels because we would be convinced that our God is not dead but very much alive in our lives and in our hearts. Amen. Offering baskets coming around. If you did not get a handout, raise your hand. The handouts have already been handed out. If you did not get one, there's several that still need a handout. Thank you. Um, I want to remind you that this weekend uh, we have a couple of different things going on. We have uh, prayer, all church prayer at 6 p.m. Uh, this Saturday at 6 p.m. Uh, we're um, kind of following Joshua, the book of Joshua, and, and um, I believe we're still doing that of how he um, asked the uh, one, one head of each tribe of Israel to get a stone and to pull it out of the river. Uh, and set it on the other side of Jordan to be a memorial uh, to keep record not just for themselves but for the generations to come that you could point to it uh, point to it as your children are watching and explain the things that God has done so we're going to attempt to do that uh, this coming Saturday night with the memoirs of Bethel Christian Ministries no doubt God has touched you in specific places, not just maybe in this building, but in the old building, but very special places in your mind. Uh, and uh, so we're going to be walking through those testimonials and those memorials on Saturday at 6 o'clock. Invite you to come and get ready to be encouraged. And we're going to build a memorial together as a thanksgiving to God. That's happening at 6 o'clock this coming Saturday. Amen. We do have a couple of other events. Mother's Day is coming up. Uh, also, uh, graduation celebration is coming up. Uh, it's going to be on a Sunday night again. What's the date on that? May 21st. It's not on the screen, but May 21st. want to encourage everyone for that particular celebration. That's a time whenever the church can celebrate with the graduates. So bring cards. Uh, there'll be tables set up just like normal. We've done it for several years now, so you ought to be used to it by now. But share it with other people. And um, we're dedicating that to celebrating with those who are graduating and then also showing and expressing our love and appreciation for them. So <clears throat> that's coming up soon. Uh, tonight I'm going to start a, a little bit of a series on the title Uncertainty. Everybody say Uncertainty. Uncertainty. I'd like to direct our attention tonight to the book of Psalm chapter 11. I'm going to read, first of all, one scripture, Psalm 11, 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As I thought and prepared for this lesson, I just was reminded of all of the fear that's in our world today. Fear. I want you to think about fear. I'm going to have you help me. Um, Nate, if you could help pass out. Brother and Sister Rose, if you could help pass out a little sticky note. Um, write down... Uh, maybe something that is uh, causes fear in your heart fear in your life maybe fear in our world so many things today that can cause us to become fearful maybe write down some things that you heard in the news in the past month maybe write, sound, write down some things you've seen just write one post-it note and then if you'd come and just stick it up here somewhere put sticky notes all over this up front here so after you write just one thing is fine after you write down one thing maybe come up here and sticky sticky that thing up here on the on the platform for me so I can read it Again, things that cause fear in our hearts, things that we've heard. Don't be bashful today. Once you've got a sticky note, write it. You need a pen. What 
causes fear in people's hearts today? What causes fear? Brother Toy is the first contestant. Maybe just stick it on here on the top there. There you go. Okay. It doesn't stick very good on that. If you stick it, maybe stick it on the wood here, on the planter, or you can stick it on a flat surface. It's fine. Thank you on the podium. Thank you. Fear. The book of Matthew says that in the last days, the coming of the Lord, men's hearts will literally be failing them for fear. Fear, fear, fear. It's very real in our world today. Wow, we have a lot of fear. I'm going to read a couple of these to you. Fear, economic failure, terrorism, war, uh, thoughts of hell and the family being lost. Anti-God society, Christian persecution. Love of many growing cold, being able, unable to reach the lost, rejection of the unknown, losing a loved one, health issues, world news, personal doubts about God that drag us down, violence on Facebook while it's happening, live streams. The enemy that controls our loved ones, failing to provide for the family, schools on lockdown, uncontrollable circumstances, sticky notes that don't stick. There's a lot of things to worry about, isn't there? There's a lot, a lot of things. Some are closer to home than others. And uh, fear is a, is a result of uncertainty in our lives. Fear isn't the seed. Fear is the end of a question mark in our hearts, a question mark in our lives. We all have question marks. Life probably could be summed up into one thing. <laughs> Question mark. The news lately, as as, uh, as as I don't know if any of you stay connected much to news. Some of you just turn it off so that you don't have to. But was there shootings yesterday or today, and the stabbings yesterday, both in Texas, in in colleges, um, government shutdown. Some of you could care less. <laughs> Some of your livelihood is derived from that. So we have the extremes even in the room today. Don't, some of us don't even really know what that would entail. Some of us know all too well what that would mean. Bad news, corporate failures, threat of war. Uh, loud, confusing voices from every direction can be heard. Such a distraction. There's so much going on in our hearts on any given day. Those are the things from without, but we also have things from within that are unanswered, that can bring us to a state of uncertainty. There is no politician or economist or financial expert that 
can remove all of these question marks in our hearts, in our world, in our city, in our families. America is not too big to fail. How many of you know that? In fact, no nation is exempt or immune from uncertainty. No family can draw a line and say uncertainty doesn't touch me. Everything in our life is volatile. Everything in our life, um, the only, uh, even, even our next breath is uncertain. What really can we really, you know, drill down into about our lives that says, okay, this is just, this is true and it's not moving. We live in a very volatile world. Uh, this uncertainty can cause rage. It can cause confusion. It, it, it ultimately causes fear in our hearts. It, it, it really robs God's people of faith. Uncertainty really can rob us of faith. Joyce Meyer said that it's in your notes, oh, it's on, on the screen here. Change is always tough, even for those who see themselves as agents of change. The process of starting a new thing can cause times of disorientation, uncertainty, and insecurity. So that even those of us that really like change. Change in and of itself is a producer of unanswered questions and never befores in our lives. By definition, uncertainty is uh, a lack of sureness about someone or something. It's an imperfect and or an unknown or unknown information, an unanswered question. The choice of two paths whose ends both are unknown. How many know that that's life? Well, if I choose this, I don't really know where that's going to take me. But if I choose this, I can try to uh, summarize the positives and the negatives of both. But the reality is I can't see too far beyond the hill. Because the, the path drops down below where I can see or even estimate. There are curves in the road that I can't see. There are situations on the roadsides of life. No matter what path I take, I'm going to have to deal with uncertainty. Uncertainty breeds fear. It breeds timidity. It breeds unbelief. And uncertainty paralyzes faith if we're not purposeful at identifying uncertainty in our hearts strength is not the answer to uncertainty how do we know that help me out why is strength not the answer personal strength why is that not the answer to uncertainty Sometimes strength can't change a situation. Sometimes strength is helpful, but sometimes strength cannot change the situation that's in front of you. How many of you know if you've got a sick loved one, no matter how much you can bench press, no matter how many squats you can do, no matter how in shape you are, too bad you can't hand that to the other person. Your strength cannot take away some question marks. How about this one? Knowledge is not the antidote of uncertainty. Why? Why is knowledge not the antidote of uncertainty? What's that? There's no end to knowledge. How many of you heard before, the more you know, the more you realize... You don't know. Take the smartest person in the world, still doesn't really understand the atomic level, unanswered questions. Doesn't under, just unanswerable. No matter how brilliant a person becomes, it doesn't remove 
uncertainty. Sad to say, some people feel if I give myself to knowledge, then I'll feel more certain about life. It doesn't work that way. Some people that just graduated college still don't know where they're going to be employed. Talk about uncertainty. Isn't that true? Knowledge does not fix uncertainty. Someone said, this was a quote, education, the path from cocky ignorance to miserable uncertainty. Neither is the fun place to be. How about money? Money is not the cure for uncertainty. Why? Can't solve. While money can buy a lot of things, money can't fix some things. Money can't fix your marriage. Money can't straighten out your teenagers, maybe for about 15 minutes. Money can't buy health. Money can't buy peace in your home. How many rich people commit suicide? How many professional football players have money to blow their nose on and yet they are in so much turmoil, so many challenges in their life? Why? Because money will not take away the question mark of uncertainty. What about seasons of life? Seasons of life will not cause uncertainty to cease. I put, I think this is in your notes, with every new season of life comes new uncertainties. Every season of life will have built into it uncertainties. And so you think you just got rid of one but you just opened up a new locker of never before. It's amazing how many young people come to me and they feel like if I can just figure out where I'm supposed to go in life, that'll fix everything. How many of you are still figuring that out? <laughs> how many of you are still trying to find out, okay, wh what do I do? Where am I? Wh where do I go? What's my purpose in life? You'd think you grow out of it. Let me tell you, you do not grow out of uncertainty. It is the reality of breathing. Uncertainty. Uncertainty doesn't necessarily reflect whether you love God or don't love God. Uncertainty doesn't necessarily reflect, reflect the fact that you have faith in God or you don't have faith in God. Uncertainty is a part of life. Some of us like to put on airs as though we're not uncertain, but it's a facade. It's really pride covering up the existence of who we really are at our core. Who can say with definite assurance you know exactly where you'll be next week? Tomorrow. No one can guarantee anything about your life or your next moments financially, emotionally, physically. Really amazing uncertainty. Um, how about the places? The places will not silence the voice of uncertainty. How many of you know that to be true? Christian, I'm talking about Christian and where you live. I'm talking about seasons of your life. I'm talking about if I could just be here at this particular geographical location, then all my uncertainty will be gone. Guess what? When you get there, <laughs> guess what's going to be waiting for you? Uncertainty. The same unanswered questions that are in Omaha are also in Denver, Colorado. Can I get an amen? And the same questions that are in Bellevue, you say, well, if I can just move to Papillion, where pastor's at? Pastor lives in a neighborhood that has no uncertainty. That's a lie. Kingsbury Hills is full of uncertainty. It's not very kingly. For fact, how many of you know that being king isn't going to take away all the uncertainty? Well, if I can just be the boss, if I could just climb that ladder, then my life will be smooth sailing. It'll take away all the uncertainty, positions and jobs, everything 
about our life is uncertain. Here's the problem, is that we will begin to allow the uncertainties to dictate our actions as Christians. And uncertainties can literally put our lives on hold. When God has said, I want you to live your life to the fullest. Uncertainty often will immobilize us. Uncertainty keeps us from engaging in any direction because it's fear-oriented. I was about to pull out, uh, turn left across two lanes of traffic. I was pulling a little trailer with the lawnmowers on it, heading to Bishop Brotts to mow his lawn. You ever been there? You're you're looking and you're trying to estimate, do I have enough time to turn on a green light before the oncoming traffic gets to me? I've got trying to estimate my trailer length. And I was hesitant. And I sat a little longer than I should. I could have made it easy. My son's sitting there going. Uncertainty causes us not to move to hold back it it, it keeps us again from engaging and doing something in a direction and I, I can test tonight that it is the lack of doing something that brings us down and really uh, takes our legs out from under us rather than the uncertainty It's when we don't do anything. When we allow the uncertainty to shut down our actions. That we are truly missing out. The culprit is not doing something. The uncertainty is the cause of us not doing something. Think about this in the context of our relationship with God and our serving God. Uncertainty plagues our relationship with God just as much as it does our, the lives we live in our flesh. What we do not know determines what we do. If uncertainty is allowed to be king, what we do not know dictates our destiny. And the questions are unending. We should rather allow what we do know to determine our actions. Uncertainty is just a visitor. This is my quote. Uncertainty is just a visitor. Let him come and go. It's going to come in your life and it's going to leave your life at times. There'll be seasons when you feel like you are certain, and then there'll be seasons when you don't have a clue. Let it come and go just like a visitor. Don't latch on to it as a sense of who you are or even your walk with God. Do you know if I latched on to this idea of, man, I know exactly what's going to happen, I wouldn't be standing here today think well if you're pastor you know everything Uh uh-uh I have just as many unanswered questions as you do (laughs) you know the difference between strong Christians and weak Christians is that is that the strong Christians don't allow uncertainty to immobilize their worship to immobilize their giving to immobilize their expression to the Lord It's not that they don't have uncertainty. It's that they've learned that life is full of them. But God is true. And that's what drives my world. So it's time to cross out the un in uncertainty. And transition from uncertainty to certainty in 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 a world where we're surrounded with I don't knows there are some things we can stake our life on and there are some things that are worthy of us grabbing a hold of and there are some things that if we will grab a hold of them it will give us courage to move beyond what's uncertain in our lives 
Back to Psalm chapter 11, verse 1. David said, Psalm 11, 1. Said, in thee, Lord, put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. I, I have it here in your notes in a New Living Translation. And it says, I trust in the Lord for protection. Can we say that together? I trust in the Lord for protection. Can you say it again? I trust in the Lord for protection. Say it one more time. I trust in the Lord for protection. This minimizes uncertainty. The simple statement, if we could ever get it to move from our lips to our heart, will change how we live our life. I trust in the Lord for protection. A lot of us say it, but we lean upon our own ingenuity. We lean upon our own calculations. And we lean upon our own abilities. David was in a spot where he had nowhere to turn. And he says, I trust in the Lord for protection. And then so David asks those that are giving him counsel. Now some people are giving David some counsel. And so he says, I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you tell me or say to me, fly like a bird to the mountains for safety. Why, why are you telling me? David said, I trust in the Lord for my protection. So why are you counseling me to fly to a safe place like a mountain if I'm a bird? I trust in the Lord for my protection. He goes on, he says, the wicked, everybody say the wicked, are stringing their bows and fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. This is what... This, he's counseling with somebody, and, and he said, I trust the Lord for protection. And they said, but don't you know that, man, they are stri they're stringing their bow, man. You are in their crosshair. They are aiming at you. Run like a wild man. Run for the cave. Run as a bird. Fly as a bird away as far as you can get. Why don't you just run? David said, God, trust in the Lord for protection. He said, but, but, but they're going to shoot at you, David. I know. I know. There's uncertainty in my life. But I trust in the Lord for protection. They, uh, that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. They said, hey, the wicked, man, they're stringing their bows. They're fitting their arrows on the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those whose hearts are right. David, why don't you run for your life? Look at verse 3. In the New Living Translation, it says, The foundations of law and order have collapsed. And what can the righteous do? This is the counsel. There's somebody sitting at David's table. And David is saying, boy, the situation. Boy, I don't know what's going to be coming up here soon. I'm not sure which direction life is going to be going. I, I, I really don't know. But I trust in the Lord. And his counselors are saying, hey, man, they've got arrows pointing at you. They're in the shadows. They are really, it's looking pretty bad, David. In fact, there is no law and order. It is broken loose up in here. There is no righteousness. There is none that is judging after God's own heart. Why don't you just run for the hills, David? There is no righteousness here. So, so what benefit is there to a righteous person if the laws of the land have fallen? Doesn't it feel like America a little bit? The righteousness of the land is fallen, David. There is no righteousness in it. The laws of righteousness, they are gone. Run, there is no sense in being righteous anymore or holding a stand. Run to, the, run to the hills. Fly as a bird, David. What can righteous do? There's a quote that says, The fastest way to break the cycle of perfectionism and become a fearless mother is to give up the idea of doing it perfectly. Indeed, to embrace uncertainty and imperfection. To Ariana Huffington. Amazing. Mothers have their first child, and my wife had their first child, and just mothers in general. Generally speaking, they have this perfect picture of what a mother's supposed to be. 
they, it's got to be just like this, and but just like this. But I'm going to tell you, you know how you spell child? <laughs> Uncertainty. <laughs> Justin on a bike is, is a nightmare for a mother. Peyton on a bike is, is uh, uncertainty. Isaac, you know, uh, in the living room is uncertainty when he's wrestling with his brother. Uncertainty all around. But when a mom has to deal with this, she can either try to fit her concepts into this paradigm of, of what a child's going to be, and her life is miserable, and the child's life is miserable. And they'll figure it out. Mothers will figure it out. You really do. Give them a little bit of time. Because children don't come with instruction manuals generally. And children don't come up, uh, come with a self-cleaning kit. And children don't come with, you know, their own band-aids. And children don't come, you know, learning exactly how to ask things. And uh, children don't come in knowing how to tell mom in the right words. And so there's a lot of uncertainty built into a child. But when a mother, she has to come to this place in herself. And she's got to decide, either I'm going to hang on to this, this picturesque, perfect idea of what a child is going to be and be miserable or I'm going to adjust and understand that there's uncertainty in all of it. As Christians, we got to do the same because many of us sit in this pew and, and as Christians and we think Christianity is supposed to be here and a call of God is supposed to be here and this is what it means to be used of God. we got this ideal of what it means to live for God. But the reality is, is that is in a perfect world. And we'll spend our lives trying to reach a place, of, a, a place that has no uncertainty in it. And we'll waste our entire life. Because life, no matter where you go, is uncertain. You think somebody's happier because they got a position? You think somebody's happier because they sing or they play or they teach? No. It's because they found a place in their life that is greater than the unanswered questions of their life. I don't care how strong you are in God, you still have questions about God Himself. And you're trying to figure Him out. And you're trying to figure you out. And you're trying to figure your spouse out. And if we're not careful, we'll have a perfect idea of what Christianity is. And we'll say, oh, I'll never get there. So we'll stop trying to live for God because of uncertainties. I just come to tell you, man, David had uncertainty. He was surrounded. He didn't know, he didn't know if Saul was going to catch him. He didn't know if Saul was going to cut his head off. He didn't know if he's going to be king. It, this idea about, man, I know where I'm going to be, that's a whole bunch of baloney. I mean, you could try, but let me tell you, man divide, man has all these plans, but God establishes the steps of a man. How many of you are exactly where you wanted to be in life? Rewind 10 years ago, say, this is exactly where I wanted to be. Not on your life, and you're lying if you, if you say it. Because there's no way you're smart enough to calculate all the Murphys in your life. To calculate all the flat tires. To calculate all the heartbreak. To calculate all the mountains and all of the valleys. You are not capable. I am not capable. And if we didn't get ourselves this far, we're not going to be the ones that get us the rest of the way. So he who began a good work in you is able to perform it unto the day of Christ Jesus. You hear me today. My God. Lord, shake us out of being bogged down. You know what bogged down means, right? A truck is going through snow or, or mud, and, and, and the mud's so soft or the snow's so deep that, that that back end just sits down a little bit, and it can, becomes high-centered, and it's going nowhere. All the wheels are turning, but you are moving nowhere. Christianity, we can't afford to just have our wheels turning, but going nowhere. We've got to learn to deal with uncertainties in our life. Sister Retha passed away. Her funeral is going to be Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Her viewing is 5 to 7 on Monday. And Man, uncertainties of life. Even when you, when you get older, you don't know the day of your departure. Only God knows that day on your calendar. So we've got to stop playing with this ideal world of Christianity and really get down where it's real. Man, there's so many unanswered things in my life. David said, I trust in the Lord for my protection. 
So David was getting this counsel. He was, <clears throat> they were saying, but they're shooting arrows, and they got arrows aimed at you, David. And, and man, there's no righteousness in this city. And, and what good is it going to be for you to be a righteous man in a very unrighteous place? Do you know what that feels like? To be a righteous person in a very unrighteous world? And David said in verse 4, it's in your notes, but the Lord is in his holy temple. This was his rebuttal. <laughs> they laid the case out why David should fly as a bird to the mountain. But David stood flat-footed and looked at him. He says, no, 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 no. The Lord is in his temple. Can you say that with me? The Lord is in his temple. Now to the casual hearer, there is nothing about that statement that would take away any uncertainty or give you uh, an ability to stand in the midst of uncertainty. But to those with hearts of faith, when you say to me, the Lord is in his temple. Dan, say the Lord is in his temple. Bishop preached something similar to this a long time ago. The Lord reigneth. The Lord is in His temple. What does that mean to a Christian? Huh? If you really believe that with passion in your heart, what does it mean to you? It's certain. And of all the question marks... And of all the things that I don't have answers for, there is one answer that will hold me right where I'm at. Steady on as she goes. The Lord is in His temple. Can you say that? The Lord is in His temple. Brother Egan, what, what happens if you get cancer? The Lord is in His temple. What happens if you lose a loved one? My Lord. Just think about it. If you were to lose a child today, what kind of questions would you have that would need answered? Huh? Why? That's a big one, right? Whoever finds the answer to that one, good luck. What other questions are unanswered? What do we do wrong? Why me? What else? Jonathan, if you lost a child tomorrow, what would be an unanswered question? What do I got to do? What am I going to do? What do I do with this hurt? Emotionally, what do I do financially? Where am I going to bury him? I didn't even think about that. There's so many questions whenever somebody passes away. It's overwhelming the amount of question marks that come at you. And you got a pastor wanting to say, hey, can we get a couple pictures? You're like, that's the last thing I'm worried about. <laughs> you know? You can, you, can understand, you can understand why people are so emotionally overrun with unanswered questions in the tragedies of life. If you change the job tomorrow, Brother Chamberlain, what would be the questions? How much money? <laughs> you know, right? Wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> Where do the questions end, brothers and sisters? So if you're unhappy serving God right now because of the unanswered questions in your life, guess what? If you don't change, you're going to be unhappy in 20 years. If Christ doesn't fulfill you now, do you know it's not Christ's inability to fulfill you that's the issue? You know that wherever you're sitting right now, Christ has the ability to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you would ask. The issue has never been God's ability or His power. It's been our faith. That's the issue today. Our, our ability to let God move us and navigate us through the question marks some will be answered but the majority of them will not be answered 
We need deliverance from being held hostage by a question mark. Some of our ministries, well, I can't because you've got a barrier up. There is no barrier. You and the way you think is the barrier. The question marks have become your jail. But God is greater than a question mark. The Lord is in His temple. He's in heaven. He sits on the throne. I believe the Lord sits on the throne. Do you believe that? He didn't stop there. David didn't stop there. He says, the Lord still rules from heaven. Listen to what David says. He watches everyone closely. How many believe that God knows the righteous from the unrighteous? The good from the evil? How many of you know that God's keeping score? How many of you are glad God's keeping score? Man can't keep score very good because he can't see everything. But God keeps the score. And if we trust ultimately in Him, we're in good hands. He watches everyone closely, examining every person on earth. David said, this is why I trust in the Lord for my protection. Verse 5, the Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates those who love violence. He will rain down blazing coals and burning sulfur on the wicked, punishing them with scorching winds. For the righteous Lord loves justice. The virtuous will see His face. <clears throat> Andy Stanley said, there will be very few occasions when you are absolutely certain about anything. Now, how many of you know who Andy Stanley is? He's a younger pastor, I believe, East Coast. Is it East Coast? I believe. Uh, I think he's a younger, uh, thriving, got a, a crazy going church. I mean, as a pastor, you're like, oh, man, I wish I could have. I wish numbers and people and, and, and leadership books. And, and he is the who's who of leadership and young pastoral positions. And if you're sitting where I sit, you're like, my, Lance, what is he doing? That pastor, blah, 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 blah. But so Andy Stanley says this. Someone of the most, that you would think is the most confident, if you ever read his books, leadership books, if you read, but he states this. There will be very few occasions when you are absolutely certain about anything. You will consistently be called upon to make decisions with limited information. That being the case, he says, your goal should not be to eliminate uncertainty. How many of you have made that your goal? If I could just get this uncertainty out. So we become filters of uncertainty. We're we, weed whackers. We're uncertainty whackers. We're trying to just get the uncertainty out of the way. And that has become our entire focus in life and in serving God. Got to get rid of the uncertainty. Just as soon as you clear one, one out, it's like grass. Two more blades are sticking up. You'll get lost in a field of uncertainty. And you say, oh man, look what I did but you're still in a forest. The goal, he says, should not be to eliminate, eliminate uncertainty. Instead, Andy Stanley says, you must develop the art of being clear in the face of uncertainty. You can be a Christian, a dynamic, growing brother in the Lord, and have more unanswered questions than you have answered questions and still be a powerful man in the Lord. You think the apostles knew everything they were going to go? Everything they were going to do? Look at Peter. God sends him a vision. Great, a great sheet let down. He's asleep. He's wondering in himself, what is this vision? He wants me to eat a pig. He wants me to eat a catfish. He wants me to eat unclean things. He's doubting in himself. He doesn't know what God is doing. 
Maybe this is just as much for me. Because I get so wrapped around the axe. I gotta know what God's doing. I gotta know where he's at. I gotta know how exactly to do everything. I'm not gonna know. You're not gonna know. And if we try to play spiritual, we're kidding ourselves. God sends Peter to follow two guys who he doesn't know. Doesn't know the address. He doesn't know what the outcome is. He doesn't even really know what God's up to. He steps into Cornelius' house. He still doesn't know. Cornelius gives him the, the background on what he saw. And then, boom, God answers a question. And it was only at that point that Peter said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons but in every nation he that feareth God is accepted of him and he preached the only thing that he knew he didn't pull a new thing out of the hat Peter just says well I suppose I'm supposed to preach the whole thing if he wants me to preach it's all I know I can't preach what I don't know I can't preach what I'm uncertain about but I gotta preach and be who I know he delivered unto him repentance baptism in Jesus name and in filling of the Holy Ghost and the gospel was sent to the Gentiles. He didn't even know what that meant in its entirety. What about Philip? God said, hey, get to ride with that chariot. Okay. How do these men operate at such levels of Christianity and spirituality? It's not because they knew everything. It's because they said, the Lord is in His temple. <laughs> And he rules from there. Can I get an amen? Hear me, instead of you being bogged down in uncertainty, develop the art of being clear. This is why the writer of the Word of God, Paul said, in everything do what give thanks why for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you you want to know what God wants from you don't worry about what you don't know what God wants from you we'll spend our lifetime wondering but instead you could be giving him thanks for what you, you do know what to do. Worship Him with all of your heart. Be faithful to Him with all of your heart. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. You can do that. You may not be able to answer the other questions, but you can do that. And I promise you, if you'll do what you know to do, I promise you, I cross my heart. You're still going to have unanswered questions. There is no nirvana of Christianity where there is no more questions. Even in your calling, brothers and sisters, those of you that feel called them, there is no end to the questions. They will always be there. I was in high school, should I go to Bible college, should I go to secular college? How many of you played that game before? God, what should I? Men have, you know, uh, put their mind in a vice. God's not freaking out. Because we're wanting to do what God wants us to do. But I've come to find out that, man, if we love God with all of our heart, and if we put our trust in the Lord, we, we get limited facts, we make the very best decision we can make that is pro-Jesus and pro-God and pro-kingdom, and if it's wrong, God's going to be merciful, and He's going he's to correct the path. Can I say it again? You are not where you are today because, because you had it all planned out this way the mercy of God that you're sitting here. It's the mercy of God that I'm sitting here. It's the grace of God that I'm even here today. Nobody deserves it. Nobody can go, Ooh. power! Nobody has that ability. Nobody in their heart of hearts and their spirit can ever legitimately say that. 
about where they are in God, or what God's doing in their life. The best we can do is be like David and get something down in us and say, I will trust in the Lord for my protection. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God is king and he rules the universe. The throne is fixed. Somebody say the throne is fixed. And the issues of his creation will be administered with justice from God who is on the throne. God is the protector of the righteous. Do you believe that today? He's the protector of the righteous. To him the persecuted may come and may always be safe. How many of you know you can run to the Lord? We have nothing to fear. Psalm 46. I gotta, I gotta hurry. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. That is more than just a scripture, believe it or not. That is an anchor to those with uncertainty. Therefore, will, we, will not we fear? Listen to this. Though the earth be removed, global warming, it's right there. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. That sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? David said, you can take the earth from under my feet. God is my refuge. There is a river, huh, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. I'm glad we know what the river is today, it's a Holy Ghost river. There is a river! Somebody say there's a river. They make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He's our high place. Where do we go when the questions get too many? Where do we run to? Where is our sweet spot where we can continue on? We have nothing to fear. Say, I have nothing to fear. We have a protector in heaven, Psalm 56, 11. Psalm 56, 11. It says, in God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Again, I say this is more than words. We've got believers in God, brothers and sisters, we've got to get to a place where this is actually in our hearts. What will man do unto me? If I'm living righteous before the Lord, they can kill me, they can do whatever, circumstances can get that bleak. But Jesus said to his disciples, he said, don't fear them which can kill the body but can't kill the soul. We have a protector in heaven. And, 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 and lastly, we can come boldly to Him for our defense. He's in heaven, but He has invited us as believers through faith to go to Him in time of trouble. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. David was saying in the Lord. Do I put my trust. Waiting on God. Elizabeth Elliot says. Requires the willingness to bear uncertainty. To carry within oneself the unanswered question. Lifting the heart to God. About whenever it intrudes upon one's thoughts. Uncertainty is going to come to your mind. But there is a hiding place. Psalm 32, 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Let's stand. If the foundations be destroyed, 
The counselors asked David, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What is the answer today to that? If all around us there is injustice, what can the righteous do? Anybody know the answer to that? We can go to the throne. Is there something that we can do? Absolutely. And it's better than any other option that you would even think about trying to do. So we can go to the holy hill of God. And we can ask Him. Let's pray that the Lord would cement this into our hearts together tonight. Jesus, thank you for ministering through the word of the Lord tonight. I feel your unction. You're connecting with hearts today. You're connecting with minds today. You are, uh, Lord, just unlocking and loosing things in the hearts of people right now. I thank you. I thank you and I give you praise, Lord, for the power of your word. Lord, for your word is unstoppable. It pierces and divides asunder soul and spirit. It, it divides the intents and thoughts of our hearts, Lord God, and it allows us to be loosed. It's a chain-breaking word today. Loose us today. Let our faith go. And let, Lord, the people of God say with certainty, I trust in the Lord for protection. Thank you for your people. Bless them now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.